this is the second biggest and second best live podcast in the world. <laughs> uh, today we have Fallon O'Neill. Hey, how's it going? It's a writer of yeah. like steampunk fantasy. Yeah, say? yeah, pretty much. It's a dark urban fantasy. Definitely has kind of that steam steampunky aesthetic. Uh, I have a love hate relationship with, with steampunk, but you know the shoe fits. So yeah, exactly. I ran across you at a local bar you were reading yeah the first book in your series yep geist the title is geist and yeah we ran into each other at an open mic night kind of deal right and uh yeah you know i had uh, i had a little bit of backup ambient chord guitar with one of my friends and you know you bought the book you you invited me over so here i am yeah i drink and i write yeah perfect drinking and right yep we all aspire to do such things. You know? uh, well, Hemingway died and died awfully, but he lived well, so there's <laughs> you know that aspect to it. There's some peace to a legend. Indeed. Would you say Hemingway is one of your inspirations, or maybe not stylistically? Not but... stylistically, but uh, Hemingway. I identify more with Morthia, the, the Scots Fitzgerald. Any uh, 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 thing? I'm more of a Steinbeck guy. Steinbeck. Yeah, Steinbeck, I think I get behind it kind of a lot more. Uh, but anyway, I like okay. Um, just his style is very laconic. It's very brief. And, um, yeah, just uh, just it, it, it's more of the lifestyle that I kind of stumbled into. Right. Yeah, yeah the more of the yeah, you know, lifestyle. You know, the right drunk at it, at it, at it sober thing. That's <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it's a, that's been a laptop sticker for, for some time. So. Right. Yeah. Nice. Was that like something, an idea you got from Hemingway, or it's like you said, you stumbled into it more? The, uh, uh, the quote stuff, you know, correlation, not causation, all that, all that shit. So, right. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I do find the altered states of mind tend to lead to better creative outputs, at least for myself. Yeah, I mostly drink. That's a, that's all I, and all I really do. Try to read, uh, uh, try, am I about to talk about the... Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Whatever you wish. Totally. Yeah, I tried weed. Uh, weed once. It wasn't my thing. You know, I drink. I write. That's what I do. I uh, usually I hang around. The, I hang around the, uh, the local dive bars. I, you know, got a chapter done there. Uh, done there last night. Uh, night, uh, night alone. I'm currently working on my fifth book. I got three books out, mm-hmm. already. And yeah, just plugging along, doing what I do. When I'm not in school, I write. Perfect. So, what what caused you to choose like the setting, this urban fantasy yeah. setting? For your writing, Holy Gothica is a love child of a lot of things that I, I grew up with. You know, some people in the audience, um, gamers out there, uh, Final Fantasy VII was a huge influence in designing the cityscapes, like that kind of layered, almost Blade Runner, but grittier and a little more on the on the industrial side. Right. That was very much, you know, a lot of '80s kind of the city of lost lost children, dark city from the from the from the from the '90s, all those kind of gritty industrial like eraser head a little bit. If you're gonna, gonna gonna get a little further back, all that kind of gritty, almost futuristic noir stuff. Right. Yeah. Really influenced Geist. Awesome. And uh, yeah, but as far as gaming goes, like I said, Midgar from Final Fantasy VII, probably top tier instant inspiration. Just replace a power company with cathedrals and you know, thinly veiled, fictionalized Catholic church, and you got the, you got the idea. There you go. My friend who also was there with me that one night, mm-hmm. he had uh, he was saying that he saw a lot of similarities between Warhammer 40k. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm not very familiar with that universe. But. Yeah, there's uh, there's definitely some elements. Mostly, uh, mostly I stray from proper nouns because you know, Games Workshop, the company that makes it, can be a little trigger happy on the cease and desist. Oh really? Yeah, they're pretty notorious. But uh, but yeah, but I but uh, but I only stick with historical terms when drawing from inspiration, like you know, ecclesiarchy, inquisition, you know, mm-hmm. imperial cult. You know, stuff that's been used historically that you can't put a copyright sticker on. Hmm. I only, I only use use that, and it and, and it challenges me as a as a creative person to kind of weave around, right? Weave around lawsuits, and you know, and I'm a firm firm believer that sometimes the best the best things come out of restrictions, hmm. creatively. You know, if you got to think out and outside the box, who knows? You might make something even better than what you expected. I like that idea. That Thank you. Uh, a lot of creativity can come out of restrictions. I've been finding that recently, like yeah. in, in life, not maybe not so much as in writing, yeah. but like a lot of like my personal life has been based around like 
what gives me the most freedom. Yeah. And I find that I actually I tend to do better with like some restriction. Yeah, some like constraints almost. Yeah, some constraints. Yeah. But then with it gives you more avenues for freedom. Like if you like if you think of like a stream, right? Totally. And then you force the stream into like a narrower like yeah, a spigot of a hose or something like that. All of a sudden the water's flowing much faster, more mm-hmm. force, more direction. And in that finite space. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting you brought that up because I've been I've been thinking a lot about that lately. There's there's a man, I think he's a writer. Mm-hmm. Jocko Willink, he's a former Navy SEAL, he talks about discipline yeah. equals freedom, which is this crazy dichotomy. I can see that. Kind of the kind of the, kind of, kind of just the integrity and the responsibility aspect of it. Just you know, just the discipline of sticking with something. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing because you know uh, you're not a writer unless you write <laughs> and yeah. you know and mm-hmm. i for one have like uh you know a thousand word a week quota that i that i always meet oh that's awesome and so that's what i do so you sorry to cut you off no 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 please i prefer conversations to move in any which way yeah. kind of an organic yeah <laughs> yeah I yeah like. sometimes i write things down but it doesn't matter so much nice but you're at you said you've released four books um, I've released three, released and I just three. shipped shipped off the fourth to my uh, publisher. Awesome. Um, yeah, all of those books are in the same universe. Yes, same universe, same setting. This yeah. is book number one. My child. This is the copy I have about halfway through it. Yep. So yeah. Far so good. Yeah. All and all same in the same u- universe, all same setting, ongoing characters. I kind of treat each book as almost like a volume of manga, as far as they're all really inter and interconnected. Yeah. And, you know, it's just part of an ongoing narrative arc. So it's less of books and more volumes, I guess. But each book is supposed to have a standalone kind of conflict and arc. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's really uh, cool. Thank you. So you mentioned some video game inspirations. Um, yeah. We were talking a little bit about, about authors, I guess you mentioned Steinbeck specifically. Yeah. What about more like within genre inspirations? Within genre inspiration. Um, Robert E. Howard's pretty big. Um, there's a character in my work. Uh, Robert E. Howard did a Conan the Barbarian, Solomon Kane. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I try to do kind of. Um, I really have a soft spot for all the late ninth, the late tw- uh, sorry, late nineteenth, early twentieth centuries pulp, mm-hmm. and some of the earliest inspir- uh, some of the earliest ideas for guys came from. What would happen if you took one of those like kind of thud and blunder kind of stories, but had kind of a you know, like a portal fantasy, a stupid nerd getting fleshed in, uh, fl- uh, fleshed in that setting. But the point was that it wasn't a brawn-based hero. It was more of a Bilbo Baggins kind of Ichabod Crane, you know, the guile hero. He uses his own wits and narrowly escapes being brutally murdered by orcs. And right. more that kind of hero in the more sword and sorcery kind of setting. And that premise eventually evolved into something, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm, I'm more Team Hobbit than Lord of the Rings. I've, I've read them both. But <laughs> anyway, I'm kind of rambling. Well, for the movies as well? Hobbit over Lord of the Rings? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean the books. I mean the books. Yeah. Before you before you kill me. <laughs> All right. So Tolkien. Tolkien. Um, uh, a lot of early. Yeah, Robert like, E. Howard. 1900s pulp is what you were talking about? You said, uh, you said, yeah, 1920th century. Uh, so, 19th century. to 20th century so you know like uh, Robert E. E. Howard uh, August Derleth uh, a little bit of Lovecraft mostly his dream the dream dream cycle stuff dream cycle oh. yeah yeah this is very different from the Cthulhu mythos his stuff is very much centered on you know you know just dream uh, dreamscapes and whatnot and adventures within those dream uh, dreamscapes uh, the dream quest of unknown Kadoth was pretty influential with the whole kind of almost Philip, uh, Philip K. Dick is uh, another big ins- ins- inspiration. I watched Total Recall before I read Weekend Re- Remembered for You Wholesale, but the Arnold Schwarzenegger one, mm-hmm. you know, the original, that one, just the whole idea that we're not sure how real the story is within its own, own context, also pretty big in- in- influence. Awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. So all those pieces kind of came, to- came together between you know, Final Fantasy, Warhammer, 80s films kind of John Carpenter mm-hmm. stuff all that kind of came to came together in, in this big melting pot of shit <laughs> that guys kind of got vomited out of yeah yeah I mean I think the best mm-hmm. writing is definitely drawn from a lot of different places yeah, I, do you think you use a lot of uh, personal inspiration like oh absolutely life? yeah when I absolutely I do when I've been when I'm not doing um, when I'm not drawing from 
you know, my interests, my hobbies, I draw from real life. I mean, I myself, I was diagnosed with high-functioning autism when I was, like, four, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the 1998. Right. And so the main character is on the autism spectrum. You know, Victor Roland is total Aspie. And, you know, there's, there's definitely a bit of myself, well, more than a bit of a bit of myself projected through him just as, just as a character. Right. Yeah, I was, I was wondering about that. Uh, yeah. And you find, like, other characters based off of other real-life people you know? Um, yeah, characteristics. I try not to base my characters off of any one person. Mm -hmm. What I try to do is take, like, characteristics and kind of make this Frankenstein of people I know with common, with, um, common aspects. Like, even, like, Charles is based on my stoner friends, just an amalgam of various traits of my stoner friends so on and so forth. Beatrice, you know, kind of the punk rock people I, I know, slash, you know, a girl I had a crush on in high school years ago. Of course. This, you know, shit like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, sometimes I lose the thread a little bit. That's nah, all good. Mm. But, uh, let's see, so do you ever come across, like, writer's block or something that impedes your progress? Yeah, it's, uh... I think it's something that every writer's, writer struggles with. You know, I, I sometimes see writer's block doesn't exist. You just plow through it. I'm like, clearly those people don't suffer from depression. Right <laughs> like, fucking heck. Uh, yeah, writer's, writer's block, it's a, it's a bitch. Right. Sometimes I, I need to take like a step back and review my, my notes. Sometimes for months I get little to no progress done. But other times I'm just, you know, yesterday I finished a 2,000 word, word chapter in one night. Oh, nice. 2,000. You said you have like 1,000 of word a week quota so yep. that's are yeah. you just gonna kick back the next two weeks or what um kick it kick it back for the for the next couple mm -hmm. couple days until i'm ready to hit the iron again yeah yeah a couple days yeah yeah you know and i'm gonna probably sell the sell books at the local kind of artist market tomorrow oh right there's yeah i forgot they do that yeah i always stumble upon it they have like they got some cool stuff over there yeah totally i'll uh, yeah. you know you know, you know it's just kind of kind of kind of thing and you bring your table and you bring your merch and you just kind of you know, you see what happens. It's kind of like a mini Holder Fest festival. Nice. Yeah. You like working on your sales pitch at all? Like, hey there, young lad. You know, like. Oh, hello there, laddie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, you know, high function autistic kid gets dragged into his own dark gothic world. Hijinks ensue. That's my elevator pitch. There you go. Yeah. Oh, what else do you need? Not a whole lot. You know, the key. The key is short. Short and snappy and laconic. Right. Yeah. What's like the most books you sold in one day? Ooh, I think like maybe like fifteen. Pretty big, you know. I'm I'm not exactly Stephen Stephen King, guys. Um, I'm just a local a local idiot who got lucky and published. Um, yeah, village idiot kind of kind of type. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I yeah, fifteen for me is pretty good. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen yeah. solid. Yeah, you know, when I've done events, I've done similar stuff to this, mostly a uh, mostly a radio. But uh, this is this is my first debut on you know live stream or anything. Uh, so yes, podcast. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> if I would have known, I would have worn what an actual t shirt instead of this shit. But here we are. Oh, so. it goes together. Oh, um, thank you, thank you. All black is definitely. Yeah, yeah. The people there are probably like, who the who the hell is this ras rasputin fuck? <laughs> but I'm a big fan of monochrome, actually. Thank you. I don't pull it off very often, but when I do, I think I look great. So, how often, you said you have done some radio. Yeah, a little bit of radio. Do you go to, like, cons? Or I have. You have? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, a SAC anime, local local anime convention, the convention I've done a few panels. Uh, my girlfriend's uh, my, my my girlfriend is really into My Little Pony, so she's mm -hmm. dragging me to BabsCon, and I'm trying to trying to trying to get a panel. Oh yeah, panel there, just you know, kind of kind of kind of kind of do like fan fiction versus literature and challenging the whole. You know, I mentioned Warhammer and veering about the copyright thing, but mm -hmm. if you really look into it though, like because because uh, I'm a history major uh, instead of an English major, I just you know I don't believe you you need a degree to write a book, and. But if you look at a lot of the great artists, you know, Michelangelo, Dante, you know, Raphael even, all of them were derivative as hell <laughs> from other artists. You know, Dante was right. ripping off Virgil when he was writing the, the Divine Comedy. <laughs> it was self-insert Bible fanfiction. Dante's Inferno is Bible fanfic. <laughs> it's all it is. Paradise Lost, too. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, John and John Milton, but some of the great epics of world literature are literal fanfic. 
course. And so, I don't know, I really want to run a, run a panel just ripping hold, but hold the concept of copyright and originality. I think that the patent is probably one of the worst things to happen to the creative world. Right. And I just, if you look back past 100 years, everyone's ripping off everyone else. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not ad advocating plagiarism, but the illusion of originality is a toxic thing in the world. Surely some original work exists. Mm, Mary, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, just literally the uh, the modern Prometheus. It was there in it was there in the subtitle. It was there in the subtitle. Yep. <laughs> yeah, nothing new under uh, under uh, under the sun. Just all works are channeled through through the author's pen. Mm -hmm. You know all that, and all that is influenced by the world around them. I think a big part of it is intent. Right? Totally, totally. Like, are you going out trying to profit off of a thinly veiled plagiaristic piece, <laughs> or are you going out there to try and contribute something to art and the world by like drawing, like you said, an amalgamation yeah. of different sources and people around? Totally, totally. And there is, and there is something to be said about commercial fiction that rides on the coattails and stuff like that, and that's very much the cynical route that I just, you know, but I also look at people like George and George Lucas, literally just Kur uh, Kurosawa movies, plus Flash Gordon, plus John Wayne Westerns, <laughs> with, uh, tied together in a nice little bow with the Joseph Campbell monument. <laughs> That's all Star Wars is, people. Nice money. <laughs> yeah, but it's also kind of good. It That's is. the worst part. I love Star Wars, don't get me wrong. Star Wars is great. I love Star Wars. Please don't, please don't hang me. <laughs> Amen. Like, yeah. <laughs> nice. I like it. You went off a little bit. That's good. Yeah, it, it happens. I do that. I do that. That's good. But yeah, <laughs> plagiarism. <laughs> Just there's nothing new under and under the sun, and you know. It's just people are so obsessed with reinventing the wheel. Creative people are oftentimes like young. I run into young authors, young musicians, young, young, young poets, and they think. They're the next. They're writing the next Ulysses, and they're literally just writing Ulysses, and, <laughs> and I'm just like, but they haven't read it, they and read it. <laughs> and it's just this. And I hate to break them to them, but dude, what you're writing is good, but it's not as original as you think it is, and that's not bad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ranting at this point. No, I, li I like the rants. Okay. Keep the rants going. Cool. Honestly. Okay. Okay. So please inter interject. <laughs> I was gonna ask you. Like, what the pro? you said you got published. Like, what was the process like? Hell. Um, yeah. <laughs> In a word, hell. Um, <laughs> writers group, and I've been part of crit critique groups since I was 16 years old. That helped me develop the callus. Even that, once you're submitting your baby to, like, agents and editors and publishers, it's a long path of, a, of attrition and, fe and bare feet against coals. Mm -hmm. It is you will get rejected but it's the matter of keeping at it it's like the trenches in world war one practically you just submit it's like so, okay story and story time with fallon right story um, time with fallon in my in, in my critique group there's this really sweet lady named uh, dorothy she is awesome and one time when i was working working and working a grocery job just minimum wage really depressed that no editors or publishers were even getting getting back to me and she recently got published and she told me fallon i'm gonna let you in on this like, little old old lady it's like throwing shit against a wall eventually something is gonna stick yes. <laughs> and uh and she was right it's the best part it's a it's a war of attrition but eventually you know they got back to me like hey can we see the full manuscript? And yeah, next thing you know, I got a publishing deal. Nice. So you're sending what, like a chapter at a time, or like, um, like you, an elevator pitch in a, like a is it a page? Is it ten pages? Usually, what I what I ended up doing, and I and I submitted my first novel in 2018, and it got published later later that year. Um, I submitted the elevator pitch, and the first like five chapters okay. each publisher is different they will have you jump through different hoops follow the instructions of that specific publisher is the best advice that i can give you and try to tailor your 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 approaches a little bit and um 
like yeah and then they then if then if, then if the publisher or editor or agent or whatever likes it they will ask hey can we see the full manuscript mm -hmm. typically uh, never never submit work unless if it's like pretty much finished unless you you're like this work is ready to see print even though it probably isn't that's when you submit not uh, not when you're still writing 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 the project mm -hmm. Make sure it's done. It sounds frustrating you have to tailor each thing to a different publisher. It's a slog. It's very bureau bureaucratic. Right. Like especially you're giving like the shit against the wall metaphor. Like Oh yeah. I'm imagining you're applying to like a hundred different places. Easily. And each place you're like, oh maybe this paragraph works better with this place. So like Easily. this chapter would work better. Like I I gotta cut out the sixth chapter, they only want five. The sixth chapter is one that starts like really pulling them in, you know? Exactly. Like it gets very bureaucratic, very dance monkey dance. And <laughs> But I I stuck with it and got lucky. That's pretty much my story. Stick with it, get lucky. Yep. Yeah. Fucking life. <laughs> it's true. Mm. So how often do you write like outside of universe? Like you're very much like head forward. You know you've been writing for your fifth straight book, same yeah. series since yep. 2018. You said. Yeah. That's where you're in the fourth year of writing the same universe. It's like a. I've been writing this universe since I was 16. The mm -hmm. first book only uh, only got finished in 2018. Right. And um, honestly, I kind of spent so much time in this u universe, I don't really plan on doing anything else. Mm -hmm. Like, I do plan on exploring things with other characters, maybe in different time periods. Right. Like, I mentioned video games. Um, Chrono, Chrono Trigger is something that I was thinking of. Have you played Chrono, Chrono Trigger? I haven't, I haven't okay. played it, but I've heard so much about it. Well, the whole, the whole idea of, like, a macro time travel plot always kind of appeal to me like having like series that just take like in the independent series that take place in different eras of this fictional world that roughly correspond to eras in our world like you know obviously give or give or take 500 year, 500 years you know like historical anachronism is always a good launching pad mm -hmm. and but tying it all together and almost like a chrono trigger meets avengers plot i think would be pretty cool yeah, nice. just the whole tying in from different characters from different works I've done is like this crossover. Mm. And okay. again, I'll probably be like fifty by the by the by the by the time I get to get to that. But it's an idea that's stuck. Mm. It reminds me of this author I love called uh, Brandon Sanderson, mm -hmm. who writes like like you said all in universe. Although he he's like very prolific. He'll release like a book a year. It's really crazy. nice. But I think like ninety five percent of his books are in the same universe, and they all. Are in different time periods, or it's like it, it's actually like a universe, so it'll be on different planets. Oh, that's cool! And there's like an over overarching like god system, like yeah, kind of like a pantheon. Yeah, 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 it's really crazy. So that that that's what it reminds me of. And it's all yeah. kind of supposed to build together by this point. We're seeing the beginnings, you know. Who knows? <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, I want to do some do something like that, but let's be real. By the by the time I get there, I'm get, I'm gonna be like fifty. Right. And more more likely, like ninety nine percent of pre presenter that I'll still be writing. I gotten this far. So. Yeah, watch well, now. Mm -hmm. No reason to. So, in your like imagination, like this this series, how how long does this series go? This with the main character. Right. Um, I'm thinking five to six books. Five to six. So you're writing five. Yeah. So maybe it finishes this one. Maybe it finishes the next one. I'm thinking six. Mm -hmm. Honestly. Um, there was a manga artist who died earlier this year, Kenta Mura. He did uh, Berserk. Berserk, oh, he died. Yeah, he's dead. Really? But Berserk was unfinished on his death. It ended on like a really good plot point. Like no spoilers, but uh, but just the fact that it died unfinished filled me with a bit of catharsis with my own work. Mm -hmm. Just the whole idea that he made such this epic cult classic dark fantasy, and I just sit there thinking put so much pressure on myself to finish it oh, don't need to. yeah just keep on writing 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 the book and it ends when it ends mm -hmm. i know when uh, when geist will end like the plot point the end point it's just a matter of getting there so here's a question you said you wrote it when you're 16 did you know yeah. where it was going to end when you're 16 uh, the ending was roughly was uh roughly in mind did you know it was going to be five to six books long when you're 16 oh no i thought it would be one book at first wow and you know the tale grew into telling as J.R. Tolkien said <laughs> and uh here we are 
here we are. Yep. Ah, <laughs> oh, shoot. I had something great to say, but I forgot it. <laughs> Another big influence of mine is, uh, you know, per the, the game Persona. Right, Persona. Persona. Have you played Persona? I have not played Persona. Ah, I've been it's great. For years. <laughs> it's a great series. Um, the new one just came out, Persona 5, right? Yeah, it came out a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, they, they did, like, a reboot of uh, per Persona 5 Royal, like, a year ago, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. And, um, but, you know, I just... My work is nothing if not a love letter to JRPGs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just get that, get that out there. And um, it's pretty much a deconstruction of self-insert fan fiction written for fans by fans, uh, by and by a fan. It doesn't pretend to be anything else. You're you're not gonna read guys to come out a wiser person, but maybe. Eh. There's some like classical literature references. There is, there yeah. is. Um, <laughs> in Persona, the main characters, because you know, guys are basically stands from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Like oh, yes. let's like they're that's literally what they are. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, Persona also derived a lot of influence from JoJo. You know, Personas are basically stands. So, you know, it's like this triangle of, you know, chicken, uh, chicken or the egg. And so, in Persona 3, the main character's Persona is Orpheus. And in Persona 4, it's Izan Izanagi. Both characters in their respective mythologies descend into the underworld to save a loved one. And fail. Mm -hmm. So, when I was writing Geist... I wanted to carry on that motif of the descent into the underworld and that and I you know Dante is a huge influence of my work to begin with so that's why Dante is the main character's geist to carry on that kind of thematic mm -hmm. motif yeah. and pay homage pay homage as you said yeah nothing truly original <laughs> I don't pretend otherwise <laughs> um, all right so you mentioned Chrono Trigger Persona um, Final Fantasy. Yep. What are some other JRPGs that you like? You love? Ooh. Honestly, that's kind of the big one. Um, as far as Western RPGs, um, I can go off of indie games that really influenced me. Um, Darkest Dungeon, huge, huge influence aesthetically. Just the whole leprosy thing, I love. In Darkest Dungeon, you can one of the char character classes is literally a leper, mm -hmm. and you know I have the whole leprosy epidemic going on as like kind of a quasi zombie thing. And uh, so that's pretty influ in influential. And just the whole kind of gothic style I really like. I like very much um, Mike, Mike Malonga. He did uh, the Hellboy comics. Mm -hmm. uh, just that kind of that, you know, that very big contrast, almost chair uh, Cheroscuro meets Vector art style. Oh, yeah. I think is really cool. And um, I just, you know, I... I draw a lot from just shit I like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Definitely. Um, with the once I get to get to the broader series um, around book four, there's like a little bit of Zelda influences. There's you know, just it's very eclectic. I, I guess is what I'm trying to say. just uh, there's no reason to not draw from you know your life is your life and if if something touched you in a way and if you're a creator you know, it's, why not use 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 part of part of that if it left an impact with you i guess that's what i'm trying to say definitely yeah oh yeah yeah if it's form informative to you as a person and if that work made you you know matter to you like pan's pan's labyrinth is a, is, a, is another one that was really that I watched in my formative years when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Guillermo del, del Toro. Um, Pan's Labyrinth was really important. Hellboy, the movies. Right. And, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you ever consider getting into other mediums? Like, say, God forbid, your work becomes very popular. You <laughs> God <know>? forbid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I get asked this question sometimes, mm -hmm. and... I would love to be a consultant. Mm. 
maybe a co-director. I wouldn't want to want to want to do it on my on my on my own. Oh, Once I get to a project that big, uh, like let's say you know, Atlas decides to buy the IP instead of sue me for for example, <laughs> and um, please. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I would totally collaborate with Atlas, you know, what, you know, Persona 6, a.k.a. Geist, fuck yeah, sign me up. Fuck yeah. Yeah, and I just, you know, or even just a small indie indie team making something you know, really good within their means. I would totally be on, be on, be on board, on board with that. Maybe, and maybe like a spinoff that takes place within the world of Geist. Right. You know, like, kind of like what, the, what they did with uh, The Witcher. Which is great. Such a good TV show. I was not expecting it to be good. I was really expecting it to be Butcher. Yeah. Butcher. You, uh, you play the games or read the novels at all? Um, I haven't read them. I want to read the novels. I, full disclosure, did not beat Witcher 3. Nah, did you get to the, uh, the ladies of the, of the wood, though? I got to Skelly then. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, you you got to the hags, though, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, the, that game has my favorite incarnation of, like, the Wicked Witch arc in an archetype. I love what the Witcher does with, like, hags and crones and shit. I think that just... So creepy. <laughs> so creepy. Uh, just that thick Scottish action uh, accent. It's just... Sorry, tangent. But... <laughs> Please. Uh, the, the the reason that I bring it bring it up is is that the, the current chapter that I'm that I'm that I'm writing, I'm drawing from that kind of Macbeth Macbeth aspect. Oh, nice. And you know, I'm very much getting into the the, the wider world of the setting that I'm currently working on with you know book five, and um, yeah, yeah, I'm going in, in some different uh, directions. Awesome. Let's see, uh, I, I usually have a couple like closing questions. I don't know, is there anything else that you want? to get into or yeah. tell people not really just uh you know if you if you like dark urban fantasy and if i haven't scared you off yet uh it's available on amazon for a three and 3.99 on kindle so uh cheap read it's short shorter than harry and harry potter and sorcerer's stone if you if you're kind of if you're bored like what i mentioned like what i have to say you might enjoy it who knows so can you buy the physical copy on amazon as well oh yeah you can you can yeah it's available in paperback too Awesome. Or uh, eleven ninety nine, and it's uh yeah it's my baby, Fallon O'Neill. Fallon O'Neill, Geist, Geist Prelude, book one. When is yeah. book four coming out? Uh, hopefully, hopefully next year. Next year. Yeah, so yeah. I too. just shipped it off to my to my publisher like two weeks ago, so it takes a little bit to get back to me, like about a month. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have the uh, book four out 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 there and. My beta reader said it's their favorite so far, which is high praise. Oh yeah, so it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, have you ever thought about like crowdsourcing or like uh, doing some kind of Kickstarter or anything like that? Yeah. I don't know if you need to, like, cause you're not fully independent. You're published, right? Yeah, yeah. So, if I sure. was going to do like a side project, yes, yeah. like you know, like maybe a video game that takes place in like the setting, and I got like an indie team team, mm -hmm. team together, I might do something like that, but. Uh, no real need need yet. So that would probably come later down the down the line. All right. I wanted to get into other mediums. So all right, let's getting a little bit off your work now. Yeah, go for it. Um, what's like the last good book you read? That's a good question. Does rereading a book count? Of course, of course it counts. I wouldn't say I like this book. But I think it's a, but I think it's an important book to dislike. <laughs> um, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Richard Dim by sorry Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond. It's a it's a history book, kind of like, ex but it's. I could go on and on and extend like, like. This interview for like another, thirty to thirty minutes on this, but uh, let's just say, environmental determinism not my jam. Environmental. Uh, not my jam. Okay. Uh, pretty much resources and technology are the sole defining factors of the course of history and civilization. I think that's an oversimplification, to say the least. Of what environmental determinism means? Of world history. Uh, world just history. environmental d d determinism is a, is a oversimplification of the course of history. Okay. 
kind of like we're fated to live the way our environment, what our, with what our environment gives us. Yes, exactly. Like uh, the whole, yeah, I could go on and on. Of course. But, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to like understand it. No, you're cool, you're cool. And basically what it is, is that like, let's say the Fertile Crescent, uh, you know, Babylon, Sumeria, you know, the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, they had obviously fled uh, floodplains and were at kind of a crossroads of trade and whatnot. And but let's say that kind of starting point, if you will, is uh, like gave them a head start, which it uh, which it did. You know, it's like a game of uh, a, ga a game of Civ. And I think there is definitely that's an aspect to it, but having that having the having like what access to resources what resources a civilization has access to I don't think that's the sole defining factor especially once you get into stuff like you know like the Mali Empire with Mansa Musa and just the sheer wealth of the sheer scale of their economy and how it impacted medieval Europe and the Islamic world and just how you how you get to the forces of Indian ideology such as the Cold War and you know the Crusades mm -hmm. and the 30 years 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 war there comes a certain point where you have other forces such as cultural forces like with the renaissance or the enlightenment and you know the spread the, the spread of you know religions such as christianity and islam throughout north africa and those forces are not defined by resources yet still shape the world Definitely. and that's why i think environmental determinism is a piece of a puzzle but Jared Diamond treats it as, as like the end all be all, which I think is horrible bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so. Have you ever had a spiritual experience? I am not a very spiritual person. <laughs> Although. I don't know. I'm really into the Jungian psychology thing. If we're going to go and go into go to like God and whatnot, I'm kind of of that Gnostic mm -hmm. kind of view. I think that if anything, God create a man create a God, and it's this like, you know, platonic placebo effect of causality. If that makes sense. Sure. <laughs> I'm not very familiar with uh, with Jung, uh, Carl Jung, right? Yeah, Carl Jung. Yeah, I yeah. I know just, of him, but I love him. Just the whole idea of archetypes being resonating psycho psychologically throughout the human condition. That there are certain there are there are certain images and concepts that resonate across the human condition i'm a believer in that and kind of view that through a classical lens of kind of like a plato uh, plato's whole the world of ideas in which case like example you know you know a tin, a, a, you know a can to can, can, for, to example, can. for example but you close your eyes and you see a can like like close your eyes and imagine a can. Your can that you're envisioning, envisioning, and the and the can in my head are two different things, but they still have the characteristics of a can, and that, and those characteristics, are kind of the archetype. Of course, it's like symbolism. And things like yes, that. yes, mm -hmm. and so once you get to get to get to concepts like God, that's when it 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 it, it, it gets in interesting. Right, and you have to be careful because some people. Uh, like it can be an emotional discussion. Yep. As well. Exactly. And I don't know. Just I'm just of the idea that I really like the idea that man didn't, uh, uh, God didn't create man. We created God, and it's like the symbiotic right. relationship of faith and well, faith as in belief in in of itself, not not faith in that transcendental kind of apotheosis kind. What do you mean by apotheosis? Like, um, I might be missing, misusing that word. Um, but just being touched by something. A spiritual experience, a religious experience. Right, that's what I was, yeah. Yeah, I just, I've never had anything like that. Of course. I lucid dream a lot. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah I'm a lucid dreamer. But, again, that's more of my own world. Is that something you do intentionally, or? Sometimes. Sometimes? You yeah. find yourself kind of, like, stumbling into it? Yeah, usually, usually I, I I notice a consistency, a glitch in the matrix, if you will. Yeah, that's when really I, interesting. When I'm dreaming, and I was like, huh, 
It's kind of cool. Yeah, sometimes I float in like a T pose willingly. It's pretty great. Usually, once I realize I'm dreaming, that's when I wake up. Really? And I've, I've tried. Like, I think I've successfully done it twice. I was really obsessed with it like a couple of years ago. I was like, okay, let me learn these things, read up on it. Yeah. You know, people say you're supposed to like, count your fingers, or you're supposed to develop habits in real life, and you do them in dreams, and they don't work. That's how you do it in a dream. There's, like a, there's a bunch of lot of little things. I, I haven't successfully done it like consistently. For me, it's noticing inconsistencies with my with like what I re- I, re- I, re- I remember happening in, in reality like let's say what's a good a good example like uh, the railway tracks close to here are like a block too far for example mm-hmm. or, or there's like a KFC where that Taco Bell should be <laughs> yeah. for example I, I love Taco Bell mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> shit like that sometimes can tip me off right yeah I, like okay there have definitely been times when I'm like I realize I'm dreaming and I let myself be swept up by it and so then I don't necessarily or I wouldn't call that lucid dreaming because I'm just like I'm aware but I'm still like a part of the matrix so to speak to me lucid dreaming implies a semblance of control right. over it like you can like Inception is a good example I think like in, in media like the ability to like alter the fabric of, of like the, the the dreamscape, I think is a fun fundamental element of, of lucid dreaming, and and it, and it could be something as simple as it's kind of like in Harry Potter, mm-hmm. like the first Harry Potter movie where uh, Harry stares at stares at the glass when Dudley is being a little shit, and he falls and falls and falls into the snake the uh, the snake tank because the glass dis- dis- disappears, mm-hmm. like that, right like a little yeah yeah it's hard to explain but definitely just the idea just the whole once you once you notice and you begin to like twist I don't know it's kind of like a weird it's hard to explain yeah definitely you can alter the fabric of the dreamscape when you lose a dream at least I can like I can fly I can t-pose just kind of (laughs) <laughs> it's pretty great uh yeah and uh sometimes i i encounter something something in my dream that could that could that could also t-pose and, and fly and then we kind of race it's pretty great um sometimes i just decide i'm just gonna fly and just wander and next thing i know i'm in this weird like you know like hyrule from zelda but here's the thing sometimes i dream about hyrule you know the setting from, from zelda and i notice that there's an inconsistency there, and it, and it's not being in Hyrule that tips off that it, that it, that is a dream, but it's the inconsistency. Like that's not from Ocarina of Time, but that's from Majora's Mask. <laughs> Bullshit. Forest and, and forest from the and from the trees. Um, forest from the trees. Yeah, seeing I can't see the the. No, but you're saying you do me. say. All of a sudden, the wild forest appears. The wild forest appears. <laughs> deals massive damage. <laughs> Fallon fainted was very effective i just like the way you said that because you said it like you switched it you know yeah the quote is you can't see the forest for the trees you're like all of a sudden a forest yeah in the trees yeah. you know? like, got it got it yeah that did that took me a second no it's good yeah. like I, that's funny just little magic jokes um all right i don't have too much more but i like to ask people like if they is there a song that's been stuck in your head lately <sighs> songs stuck in my head lately yes the answer is yes I almost always have like ambient songs stuck in my head in the background, honestly. And what is it right now? Uh, main theme of Final Fantasy Seven, the original version. Nice. Yeah, the nice one that plays on on the on the overworld map, okay. specifically the ending part, like the ending minute of that. That's in my head. Do you find it's usually to do more soundtrack songs? Almost always. Really? Yeah. Okay. But that's what I like to listen to, so it makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's like ambient noise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, do you find you definitely find yourself listening more to the video game soundtrack than you do to like, um, uh, like Drake or like absolutely some local indie artist, something like that. Like, absolutely, interesting. Yeah, just it's what I listen to. I just I really like it. It resonates with me. Yeah, um, yeah, man. Just something about video game music. I always listen listen to it when I'm writing. Do you go headphones or do you have to? Yeah, uh, yeah, I got yeah, I got headphones. Come strapped. Yep. 
You got something playing at the moment? Nope. I'm out of data. Out so. of data. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been the second biggest, second best live podcast in the world. Fallon O'Neill, Tyler Kroll. This is Guys Prelude, book one. Book one. Book four is on the way. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, no worries.